Dr. Terhune, uh, Superintendent of Rat Tone Public Schools, the Rat Tone Public Schools is in a different situation than they've ever been in the past in that uh, the population of Rat Tone has been dwindling. Parents uh, have got jobs that they are required to move at and they're taking their students with them. Um, that's put Rat Tone Public Schools in a position that we're going to have to consolidate. How? What are some of the, uh, the things that the school board is looking at to consolidate? And what are the numbers that uh, we're really having to look at? Uh, cost of keeping the building open, mm -hmm. payroll, and so forth, that uh, is, is kind of driving this as we go along. Well, those are all good questions and issues, uh, Marty. I'll tell you that uh, uh, there has been, I guess, and I've, of course, I've only been here a little over a year, despite the fact that I'm a native of New Mexico. I, I actually was in Pueblo yesterday, and uh, some folks who had lived here years before, I uh, was in a meeting there, had said, how's the mine doing? And they didn't even know the mine had closed. That's been some time. Years, yeah. yeah, and then, of course, the... the Mesa Park as well. So we, there has been some changes in the economy in Raton over the years, and most of the folks here in the community know more about that than I do. What I know as a superintendent is that um, whenever you have a school district, you have to operate as efficiently as possible with the limited resources that you have. So, for example, the revenues we get in this school district are designed to serve the number of students that we have enrolled. That's usually the base foundation for any formula that a state uses to, uh, to determine how much money you get. Where does, where does that state mo that money come from to operate school? It's mostly from the state, right? Yeah, there's a great deal of it in which uh, uh, the state of New Mexico, for example, would like to be what they call in this United States uh, an equality state. In other words, they pull money from the taxpayers across the state, put it in a large account. Of course, obviously, they break it into funds and they tell you under certain statute uh, how you can spend this money. But a large amount of it is that we receive in this, uh, this school district comes from the state and it's determined by enrollment. There's also a form that that same formula includes the number of staff that you have um, and some of the needs that you have, a special needs, for example, special needs students in um, special ed or language or in other areas that they consider at risk. So there are specific funds that the school district will get within this wide formula that they use to give to each school district in the state. So we get this money, though, primarily based on enrollment. And so you hit the nail right on the head when you talked about the uh, declining enrollment issue. You know, I um, this is probably the one of the most difficult challenges any community can face in that uh, um, the way, uh, the way the funding is given is based on the year previous. So let's say, for example, we have uh, uh, 1,000, like last year, probably about 1,027 to 1,050 students, uh, which is down two or 300 for over the last five years. Um, that money um, is given to us um, based on last year's enrollment for this year, and then next year's budget is going to be the money based on the enrollment this year. So there's a little bit of help in that we're operating on a little bit more money that we normally would have at the current enrollment rate. So for example, we're just right at 1,000 right now. Last year we were about 1,000 plus another 25 to 50, depending on the time of year that we counted it. So we have a little more money based on that. But the state also asked us to do uh, an estimate on the number of kids that we're going to have. So if we make it, so for example, my first year here last year, this might be a little more technical than you want to go into, Marty, but last year, for example, we estimated that we would have a certain enrollment. We fell way short of that, but the state paid us for it. So at the end of the year, we had to give it back. So here we were in a situation where we were spending money in my first year as a superintendent as if we had this number of kids, and we didn't. And so we had to plan for giving it back at the end of the year. And the budget had already been established, uh, set by the board and approved by the state. And now we're making major adjustments to it because of enrollment. And this is continuing to happen. This year's enrollment, last year's enrollment was well below the year before. This year's enrollment is down, you know, 25 students from where we ended up last year. Um, and uh, I suspect by the end of the year it's going to be worse. 
So yeah, the issue is how do we right size our schools? Some people say, well, you're downsizing a school. And why don't we just keep our schools the way they are, the way we have smaller class sizes? Isn't that good for kids? It is. It is good for students. At some point, though, um, we're paying utilities and custodial and maintenance to maintain a building or two more than what is necessary. And so we end up finding ourselves uh, taking money from classroom, you know, for example, classroom supplies or technology. And even, I know a lot of people don't want to talk about this sometimes, but even raises for our staff because if you can recruit and retain um, the best teachers, think about it. If your salary is lower than anybody else in the state, and this is just hypothetical, I'm not saying it is, but let's say it's lower than any other district in the state. When folks come out recruit, we're recruiting for teachers across the state, what does a district who's paying less than anybody else get? They get what nobody else has taken. And that is not what we want for our students. So pay raises, despite the fact that they're controversial, allows us to recruit and retain the very best educator staff and also to provide professional development to maintain their level of expertise. Anyway, we need to get probably to the options that the board is uh, discussing right now. When the bond failed to pass, um, by the way, the bond would have created the right size. We probably would end, even though we were bonding for a K through five school, we probably would have eventually ended up the way things are going, the trend, with a K through six, a pre-K through six. And then we would have been looking at sometime in the future, long term, maybe 10, 12 years down the road, looking at bringing our high school into a seven through 12 configuration. That would have been manageable and that would have been a good right size. I've been in a 7 through 12 configuration. I was a superintendent of a district of 600 students. This is 400 less than we have here. But 600 to 1,000 lends itself well to a pre-K through 6 in a 7 through 12. That way you only have this one transition for students. Basically they come in the beginning in the kindergarten year and they stay in the same uh, school community for seven years if you count pre-K through six, then they make this transition to high school and they finish out their school there. That keeps the turbulence that kids experience to a minimum. And it keeps the con continuity of our staff and the education process, um, maintains that with full integrity and in a good way for our kids. So that's kind of what we were looking for when we were going for this bond. And as you know, we came very close to it. We were 123 votes away. And um, I'm absolutely certain, if you don't mind me saying again, that we have those votes. We just weren't able to get them to the polls this time around. Right. So so what do we do now? So at this point in time, uh, what you're going to have to look at, uh, since we didn't get the bond passed through, we can't build a consolidated school. We've got to take the three older schools that we have, then, or combine into the middle school, it looks like, as mm -hmm. one option, mm -hmm. so that we can cut our utility cost and that's one of the things I'd like for you to kind of sure. uh, enlighten the public on is what it actually costs to operate one of those schools as far as utilities and, sure. and staff. If you yeah. would, okay so we do have a spreadsheet that we shared with uh, I've shared with the staff with some of the service club the Kiwanis and the Rotary and I'm going to get out to some more and we shared it in two board meetings but uh, so let's look at the options we have uh, basically four options. The board has narrowed them down to two. And why don't I just talk about those two uh, because that'll pretty much give everybody an idea of what we're looking at in the way of savings. Um, option one and option four, what we've done with this spreadsheet, and it's available to anybody who wants it, um, we've created a column that says utility savings. We've created a column that says salary and benefit savings. This is providing that we lose the, uh, lose the building. So for example, option one is losing one of our buildings. We mothball one of them. There's a certain number of, certain amount of money that uh, is saved in utilities, a certain amount of money that could potentially be saved in salary and benefits, a certain amount of money that could be saved in transportation, a certain amount of money that could be saved in operation and maintenance. And um, then uh, one that was mentioned to me today that I absolutely neglected to think of, there would probably be savings potentially uh, depending on whether we went to a four-day week or not, in uh, in food service, so that we'll set that off on the side for right now. Let's just talk about uh, 
there are two major options. One option is uh, one. Of the option one is to um, move our kids out of one of the elementary schools and put them into the two remaining elementary schools. Um, whether that, and then there's an option two and three that also loses an elementary school and moves them around. But the savings is pretty much the same. If we go with that option, and in this particular case, the board is interested in dropping uh, Kearney. And the reason, uh, there's been some discussion, they may change their mind, but there's been discussion about which one of the schools, Longfellow, Columbian, or Kearney. Um, from my professional standpoint, and I did spend some time in the Engineer Corps in the United States Army, so I have some background in it in construction engineering management, Kearney probably is, despite what the state says, probably the building that has the most issues as far as structure. You know, we have walls separating, we have foundation settling, we have exterior walls crumbling, um, and it's, uh, even though we like the neighborhood and we like the way it looks, it has uh, some issues. So if that building were to go away, and that's option one, the savings in utilities would be twenty-seven thousand five hundred sixteen dollars and seven cents. <laughs> now, is that a, a month or is that an, an, a, annually? And bless Lita Sanchez, our uh, business manager, for putting the seven cents in there. She's very, very technical about these kind of things. And though this is an estimate, she had the formula that she used. And what we did is we averaged the last three years for Kearney. And now, if you go to the state and ask them what the the cost per square foot, there probably might be a little bit different uh, uh, breakout. But if you look at hardcore numbers, what we spent in utilities the last three years, the savings in utilities for dropping kerning would be $27,516.07. The next column over is salary and benefits. And this became a little bit more um, of a guesstimate because when you get into the idea of dropping a school, and start sharing staff and trying to look at how many kids are going to be in each classroom. You really just can know all, all you can do is do your best, your best guess. But let's just say, for example, uh, we have two two custodians per building, so that would be two less custodians. And let's say that we have a librarian, that would be one less librarian because if they went to another building, that librarian, those kids would be served by that librarian. Um, let's take a look at the administrative assistant for this, the principal. That would be a secretary position. Um, a principal, we could probably drop a principal, though that would be up for debate for the first one or two years because the transition might uh, require the principal to be there. We'll have to make that decision later. That's why I'm saying this is an estimate. Because if you think about it, the same number of students exist in the district. You take a principal out of it or any teacher out of it, we've still got the same number of kids. So somebody suffers, unless, of course, we can figure out some way to increase the capacity of another administrator to do the work or increase the capacity of a teacher to do additional students in her classroom. But when you get right down to it and get all that figured out, it comes to almost $400,000. What Lita has down here for option one, which is moving Kearney out and mothballing it and uh, moving the kids over to Longfellow and Columbian, comes to about $395,364. Some of the probably possibly uh, you've probably got teachers that are close to retirement, and some of that would probably fit into this as well, in, in some of the thinking as well, uh, as part of the consolidation. That's a good point, Marty, and that <coughs> that's exactly what's been happening over the last three years, even before I was here, um, as enrollment dropped, and Mr. Wilden, and then later myself came in. When enrollment dropped, we have less money for teachers next year, and so we were looking at rifting. But it's worked out so far that we've had enough teachers and the right teachers that we've been able to make adjustments without doing a rift. And we hope that will continue because we really don't want to tell somebody who wants to work here and has bought a home and has children in our school that, you know, we don't have room for you anymore because, you know, that we don't have the students or the budget. We hope that that's what will happen. That's what we keep our fingers crossed for. So the, the ultimate savings for option one, which is to drop Kearney, and put um, pre-K 1 through 2 in Longfellow and grades uh, three, f uh, 3, 4, and 5 in, uh, in Columbian is uh, $485,746.07. That's an estimate uh, for one year. That's almost a half a million dollar savings. Now, you think about what that could buy for the school district. Uh, first of all, we, we would be able to afford to keep the staff 
whatever staff we're, we're maintained, we'll be able to keep them and pay them, uh, which is something that we're, we're not going to be able to do if we keep up with what we're doing. But look at the middle school, for example. They, they have a huge roof issue. Now, we're going to be using the middle school for a lot of years. We all know that Longfellow, Columbia, and Kearney are the, are the schools that have the most issues. And I would say Columbia and Kearney probably the two of those three that are probably have the most issues structurally. But the middle school got to be used for a number of years. So right now it has a roof. The state had brought in folks, and we had it assessed, and they say the whole thing needs to be replaced. It's almost a million dollars to replace it. And they're willing to step up and give us two-thirds of that if we're willing to pay the other third. Well, we don't have it. And with the bond not passing, we weren't able to pull any money out for that middle school roof. So we have two options. We can keep patching and patching and patching and patching, or we can take the state's money and fix this. But we could do that if we let one of the schools go. That's just one example of the way to spend the money. Uh, we could also increase supplies to our staff. Um, we could uh, maybe even put a school resource officer in one of our buildings full time. So these are the kind of things we could afford to make our schools safer and uh, physically sound and uh, we would have to figure out the educational part of it because if you move kids into these smaller buildings you're going to probably have some class sizes that might be a little bigger and so our teachers have to be trained to the point where they can handle larger groups and uh, be able to create the interventions that our students need when you get class sizes that are 23 to 27. On average what what size do we have uh, what are our classroom sizes right now on average? That's a good question, too. You've got a, a lot of good questions, I think, Marty. You've been keeping up with this, haven't you? Uh, it varies from kindergarten all the way up to fifth grade. Uh, kindergarten, for example, had over 100 last year. It was, a, it was an absolute zoo down there. And we had 25 kids in every classroom, and there were five of them. And to put 25 kindergartners in the classroom, in five classrooms in a small building, is quite an atmosphere. And kudos to our teachers who... Uh, who managed to deal with that in a good way. And of course, the state requires us to be, I think, no higher than 20. Uh, it's either 20 or 21. So what we needed to do at that point was to put um, paras in each classroom. And then we had help from, from the community. We've had grandmothers come in and help us. So one of those classrooms, 500 square feet, would have 25 kids in it, a teacher, a para, and a grandmother. Believe me, that was a classroom that was full. But on the other end, on the fifth grade, and... Um, not so much. You know, we probably had anywhere from 15 to 20. So, and then this year, just so you kind of get an idea of the trend, we didn't have as many kindergartens as we did last year, but we had almost, it was about 98, 99. So it wasn't 115 or 120, but it was 98, 99. But it was still a very large group. Now, if this trend con continues, and this is the interesting part of our whole dilemma, is if we continue to get 100 students in every year and, and it's maintained over time and we don't lose anybody, we might be back up to 1,100 again or so in the future. I don't think that's going to happen. We had over 100 last year and we had less this year and we're probably back to our normal 80 to 90 that you've had in years past uh, next year. That's what we're thinking will happen. So we have to kind of do our best professional judgment on these numbers, but that's the numbers. Anywhere from 100 little over 100 at the at the kindergarten end and down to about 80 or so, 80 to 85 at the fifth grade level. So. And option number two uh, that you, that the school board is looking at, that's even more consolidation? Yeah, it is. And actually, there were, there were four options, and we dropped two and three off the, off the map. That was uh, getting rid of Columbian. And then the other option, number three, was to uh, pack kids into... Um, the elementary school, excuse me, the, the middle school, the board decided to drop those two options. You stick with option one, which is to drop uh, Kearney and consolidate into Longfellow and Columbian uh, to, to at least investigate that. But the, now option number two, and since we've taken two and three off the board, option four has moved up to option two. So we only have two options. I hope that's not confusing to your viewers. But the option two now, as you described, is our old option four, which is to do 7 through 12, um, and that would be it would be where you'd look at kindergarten, pre-K through uh, 2 in Longfellow, and then um, our middle school would pick up 3rd, 4th, 5th, and 6th. 3rd and 4th would be on the bottom floor, 5th and 6th probably on the top floor, and each one of those classes would probably remain self-contained. In other words, you wouldn't rotate kids through 
hourly classes. They probably keep their teacher all year except for the electives like art or PE or things like that. So then, though, so basically the pre-K through five or six actually would be two buildings, uh, Longfellow and RMS. And then we'd move seven through 12 up to the high school, which actually has the square footage. But if most people think about it, um, if you've had any experience with seven through 12 at all, you'll notice that most of those are configured in such a way where you have seven through 12 um, in kind of a wing by itself. And then you walk around the corner and then there's the high school. Right. So that's usually how it's done. Well, this school is not built for that. Uh, and we do have a freshman academy on the upper floor. So let me just give you a hypothetical. Um, we have some wonderful specials. What I call specials are classes like woodworking, art, uh, band, uh, PE. Um, Linda Ortiz's homemaking class, I call homemaking. I think it's culinary arts now. <laughs> I've got to keep up with the right language. But she has a great class over there, and we have great facilities. Uh, obviously, we have people over at the high school that would love to bring in those kids, 7th and 8th grade woodworking, 7th and 8th grade band over here at the band room, so that everybody's in the same place. Uh, they love to keep all those kids in culinary over here and stuff. But we have these wonderful facilities in the, in the RMS, and so what I was going to suggest and am suggesting to the board is that they look at the possibility of bringing our, uh, you know, you have uh, 3, 4, 5, and 6 in that building all day at the RMS. And then bringing our high school 7th and 8th, if we do this second option, bring them to the high school first thing in the morning in a bus, excuse me, the middle school in a bus, and let them take their electives in the morning. So they could take woodworking, PE, or band, or culinary arts in the morning, one of the, do three of those, and then get on a bus that we would provide for them, come to the high school, cafeteria, eat an early lunch, and then by that time, the freshman academy if you don't know what I'm talking about here, the freshmen spend the entire morning upstairs in the high school in one area, just a freshman, doing their core subjects, math, science, social studies, and, and uh, LM, uh, uh, ELA or language arts. And then they come down to the bottom floors and mingle with the rest of the school to do their electives. Well, when they move down to the bottom of the floor, at the same time the middle school or seventh and eighth graders finish their electives and their lunch, they could move up to the top floor and we've got just about almost enough room to do that. And so what you'd have is 7th and 8th, for the most part, not mingling with the 7th through 12 configuration very much. Just like you would with a normal 7th through 12 where you have a wing for 7th and 8th and you come around the corner and there's a high school. In this case, there'd be these kids separated by RMS in the morning and then upstairs of the high school in the afternoon for the most part. There would be some exceptions. And so for the most part, 7th and 8th would still be separated, even though they'd be a 7th through 12 configuration for the high school. Probably give one of our principals 7, 8, and 9, and then give the other principal 10, 11, 12. Um, that's probably how that would work out. The other option is to give the principal 7 through 12 and give them an assistant principal. So that's a, that's a thought. On the other hand, we can just put all our kids in that building and just let them mingle with the high school and make sure our staff are out there doing their job and we're not seeing any inappropriate behavior between, you know, older kids and younger kids and things like that. So, But that would save the district. Let me get back to the money part of it because that's really where the, the board is looking to go. Um, the utility savings would be twice losing, I mean, you're losing two billion, so it would be twice 25000 so it would be close to 50000 The salary benefit savings would be around 800000 The transportation savings, depending on whether or not we uh, went with a four-day week or not, would be about 63000 Total savings would be $900,000 is our estimate if we dropped two buildings. That would really increase our ability to recruit and retain, to fix buildings, to provide technology, to um, you know, do all the things that we right now have to put on the shelf because we don't have the money. And so um, it, it's huge. That's a huge savings, $900,000 if we do the option, the second option. So that's why the board's looking at these things, Marty, and they want to look at that. And, of course, I will tell you that our staff, they've been surveyed. They're about 50-50 on the consolidation, uh, slightly under 50% against. No, actually, uh, four, and slightly over 50 f against the consolidation. 
And there was another survey put out for the four-day week because the board wants to look at all options for saving money. Uh, though right now they've asked me as a superintendent to put the four-day week on the shelf because they don't have enough information to go forward with that. And they're hearing a lot of um, negative input from the community as far as, you know, the traditional issues of not having child care and um, instructional time potentially not being uh, the same as it was before. So do the savings offset those kind of things? So they've asked me to put the four-day week on the shelf, though we are surveying just so that we have the information in case we ever need it. And they're looking at maybe transportation savings. They're trying to figure out ways to save money on that. Um, they're looking at all ways that we can save money. The primary one is school consolidation. So that's where we're at with that. And um, I will tell you, I would like the community, if they would please let us know. We have a survey out there. We have one here at the school. They're going home to the parents, to our students. Uh, let us know how you feel about these two options. Let us know how you feel about the four-day week, so at least we know. I'll be putting some of these surveys out in barber shops and stores here in town. Be looking for them. But if you don't see them, drive on up here. Stop in front of the door, walk in, fill it out, stick it in the box, and walk away. It's important. It is. It's, it's one of the bigger things that's uh, affecting the Rat Tone community uh, because the students, the kids, um, school activities, those are the things that the community can get behind and support and of course I, I've, I hate always bringing this up but you know you always hear the complaint there's nothing to do in Raton but yet in small communities the school is where the activities are at those are the things we need to get behind and those are the things that we need to keep going to keep the kids interested keep them out of trouble and of course that all takes money once again, this is what you're looking at. Um, you've run into the issue, I understand, at the beginning of the school with the bus company and some of the, uh, and some of that. So that's going to be another economic issue that the school board will have to look at coming up this year. What is the timetable that they want to try to figure this issue out? Well, um, we need time. They haven't told me, but I've told, they've asked, what, what the board has said is we need to do this as quickly as possible. And I agree because I need at least, as a superintendent with our staff, I need at least a full semester in the summer to make any of these changes so that when school starts next year, kids come to school and they don't have, you know, they don't have this uh, chaotic environment or, you know, morale issues. So we need to have it settled, straight, and figured out. Transportation, the schools, the teachers, the buildings, everything ready to go. Um, consider the fact that uh, if we're going to let, you know, custodians or support staff go, or maybe even some some professional staff or principal, they need to know in enough time to go out and look for work. I mean, these are good people who contribute to the economy here and who have children in our school. They need time to react to this. Um, so I'm thinking January. If the board can come up with a decision before January, then I can have the second semester along with our staff and any community members would like to help us with this in the summer to do some of the stuff that we need to do. You know, when we were talking about uh, saving money, one of the things we would have saved if the bond would have passed would have been some of the infrastructure necessary for our technology. You know, the cabling, the fiber, the switches, the servers. Even smart boards are usually a part of the construction project, and now we don't have that. So I am asking the board and they have so far on the 3-2 vote agreed to at least go forward with uh, imposing a modest uh, tax on the local school district and this is this can be done without a vote um, by New Mexico statute school boards can impose a tax on the local community without a vote to pay specifically and only specifically for educational technology so that would be computers and classrooms, that'd be servers and buildings, that'd be cabling. Well, if we haven't decided on what building we're going to keep, how can you lay that out? So we certainly don't want to be putting cable and infrastructure in a building that we're not going to be using. So one has to happen before the other, and the other needs to happen before school year starts. So we need to make a decision on which one of these options that we're going to use, and then we can make a decision on which building we're going to uh, provide with technology providing the board will, will, will provide this, uh, this tax relief for us. 
and then we will probably for about $400,000 we think we can get the kids where they need to be as far as preparing them for the 21st century by having technology they need in their buildings um, going forward. But which building? That's the question. <laughs> so we have two things going on here and one's got to happen before the other and that's a lot of work. Um, if I just might say, I'm not trying to um, say that the board and I are at odds because we're not. I work for the board, the board works for the community. Uh, my initial recommendation to the board was let's try to pass this bond one more time. <laughs> Three strikes, you're out, you know. Uh, give it a year and then try it again. Uh, then we wouldn't be doing all of this. We could just do it right the first time and save some of this money on technology for the construction project and also have the money we need to do demolitions of a building, which we won't have in this particular instance. Uh, when we do one of these two options, we either have one or two buildings out there that we'll be putting plywood over the windows and taking the water out of the pipes and shutting the, you know, the utilities down to a bare minimum, doing all the things that the New Mexico uh, Historic Society requires us to do to keep those buildings in good shape, but no more than that. Um, and they'll just be sitting there. Uh, I guess if we have an influx of oil and energy, we can go back to them if we need to. If we don't, they'll sit there until somebody either buys them or uh, we can give them to somebody who can use them. But they'll be there, which is something we were trying not to do when we were doing the bond. It's just unfortunate that we didn't get the voters out and we could have done this in a more, um, in a more professional, complete way than what we're doing now. But this is our second best option. We can't keep uh, paying these kinds of money for buildings that we don't need. And, you know, like I told told your partner over at KRTN, Billy, the other day, I, I told everybody when I came in here I wanted to be the best superintendent anybody had ever had in this district, which would be a, a hard thing to do because you've had some good ones. But it looks like I'm, if I'm going to be that, it's not going to be the most popular or the most famous. It's going to... It might be the best, but it's going to be managing the downsizing or right-sizing of our school, which isn't always very popular. And I, I think, you know, I can do this. I know how to do it, but it's not going to be a happy day for some people. Well, it's, it's a trend that's going on in other places in New Mexico. We're not the only ones. Ratone is not the only school system that is having to look at consolidation or some form of savings. And one way or another... That's true, except for those uh, lucky communities or fortunate communities that have oil and gas move in. Then they're, like I was talking to the Roy superintendent the other day, he started his, you believe it, the entire district with only 36 kids a few years back, and now he's up to 80 something because of the, you know, the oil energy, energy industry moving into that area. And there are other places in southern New Mexico that have, if you want to call that good fortune, it surely is good fortune when it comes to revenues. But also, there are some problems with overcrowding schools immediately with people who aren't from this part of the country. They come in from different parts of the country that have been unemployed a lot, aren't used to the way we do things, and then crowd our schools with a different culture. So they have their problems, too. I know, because I just experienced this in Rollins. Uh, a lot of money there, but a lot of different people, and it was a challenge in itself. But the money wasn't a challenge. Here, the money is the challenge. And by the way, I want everybody to know out there what a great bunch of kids we have. You know, I get to adopt this group of young people as my family. Um, I have 31 grandchildren, a couple of great grandchildren, and they're in schools all over this country. And I hope that there's a superintendent in a community that's advocating for my grandchildren the way I'm trying to advocate for this community. That's all I can hope for. These are my young ones, away from my real young ones. These are my kids, and I go out in those schools, and they're just great. These kids at the high school, you know, clean, look you in the eye, motivated, smart, same thing in the middle school. We just have some great young people in our school, and don't anybody tell you any different. And it's going to show itself in school grades very shortly in the future. Um, it's just good. It's a good time. Very good. Thank you, Dr. Trillian. You're welcome. You guys have a great day.